Hello and welcome to the last two sections for chapter one and what is psychology. Today we're looking at section 1.6, the experiment, and 1.7, evaluating the findings. So um, if you really want to like test something, you want to really extrapolate data and get empirical data about if something has a cause and effect relationship, you use an experiment where the researcher can control the situation being studied. They can find, if they can eliminate all variables except for an independent and dependent variable, they can find a cause and effect. Uh, there are ethical guidelines that must be followed. Like in the previous video, the Goldberger study where he fed poop and all that, that's not ethical. Don't do that. Uh, there are college review boards. There are EPA codes of ethics. Um, there's there's uh, IRBs, institution review boards, that look at all potential studies and make sure that they're okay because... In the picture here, you have one of the most notorious psychological studies, the Stanford Prison Study. Uh, you go back to the Milgram's shocking study that he did. Uh, and those were like the bad boys of psychology, and they gave it a bad name. So they got to make sure they're going to do no harm. That's what ethics in psychology is, is basically do no harm. Uh, so this is for humans and animals. And then there's informed consent. If a person wants to know the results of a study, they, they have the right to know that. You, um, as an experimenter, as a researcher, you don't have to give them the whole details about everything, but afterwards they have the right to have that data. And then there should be some debriefing to let them know this is why we did this afterwards, uh, to let them know that, hey, it was part of an experiment and whatnot, all a part of being ethical. So variables. The independent variable is the one that is manipulated by the researcher. For instance, um, maybe I want to study if people drinking coffee um, behave differently. And so I'm going to give them decaffeinated coffee and not tell them that. I'm going to put them in a room uh, and I'm going to give them coffee and then that's the independent variable. And then the dependent variable is the effect. I'm going to observe their behavior and see if they act like they have more energy. Now I need that. That's my experimental group, the coffee group. I need a control group, and so I need a group that doesn't get the independent variable. I need to look at one group that doesn't have coffee, even if it's fake coffee or decaffeinated, um, and see if their behavior matches or differs from the experimental group. You can do the same thing with a variety of things, and that, that's, that's the basics of, uh, of science and experiments. Um, there's some college studies where they did the same thing that I described with giving non-alcoholic beer to a group and seeing if they acted inebriated versus watching people not have anything. Uh, and so the experimental condition is the, the group that gets the independent variable is the experimental condition. Uh, the control, they don't receive the independent variable, and so you have to have that to kind of compare, to make sure it's not just a coincidence uh, or the placebo effect. Without a control, you cannot be sure that the behavior would have occurred anyway. And so that's important. Maybe the social situation of just being in a room with strangers makes people more energetic. Uh, and without the control, we can't know that the coffee is the what... Uh, you know, persuaded them to do that. Then you need random assignment. You can't be like, oh, look at that guy. He looks skittish. Just give him the coffee and that guy looks sluggish. Put him over there. It has to be random. Uh, you can't just pick people all you want. And then there is the placebo effect. Um, people believe when they take a pill or if they have or getting help that things are going to happen. The mind can heal. Uh, and it's fascinating. People have studied the placebo effect uh, for, for a long, long time and they're finding that it is a real thing. Uh, this little meme here, my sister had a headache and we ran out of Advil, so I gave her a Skittle with a glass of water, and it probably worked. Uh, in the green books, I'm not sure about the purple books, there was a, a study, and I have the, the, the experiment here, about Viagra working on women. And they found that, you know, 41% of women, um, it worked. Uh, but they also found the placebo worked better than Viagra. And so it was the mental thing that they were getting help in terms of stimulating their love lives and uh, helping their... Uh, their, their sex lives. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so experimental effects. Expectations can influence the, the results of the study. And so a single blind study uh, would be that you, you don't know which one's the control and which one uh, is the experimental group. So the experimental effects, if they know that that group has the coffee, they're like, oh, look, they're, they're going to pick up on ticks. That one, that guy's skittish. He keeps scratching himself. You know, he's a nervous habit. That, that they're believing that the coffee has caffeine. So that's the experimental effects. A double blind study is where they don't know which is which. Uh, they just observe. And so only the person manipulating things, the person pulling the strings like the godfather, um, a group doesn't know if they're the experimental group, another group doesn't know. So maybe you do one where you give coffee that is caffeinated, you give coffee that is decaffeinated, and then they don't know which coffee they have. And so they're not, you know, being, their expectations aren't affecting the experiment. And then the person observing it 
it gets room A and room B. They don't know which is which. They just observe behavior and so their own bias doesn't come into effect. This is the standard practice for drug research. It does have advantages and limitations though. It's not always a good representative sample. Most uh, subjects of college, or excuse me, of psychological experiments are college students. You can make money in college by subjecting yourself to psychological experiments. Yeah, a little extra cash, go get some wiener schnitzel on a Saturday night, go do a psych experiment. Uh, participants try to make the experiments work. When you sign up for something, you want it to work. You want it to be good. Um, and then there's more control for the researcher. It means it's less like real life. Uh, in a lab setting, it's not the same. A little thing here, single blind study. I, think, I guess we're the control group. Uh, so here's just kind of a, a recap. The different research member, uh, methods in psychology, their advantages, disadvantages. This is out of your book. Uh, and so they're all, none of them are perfect. They all have advantages and disadvantages. They all look to try to get, you know, more knowledge on the, the you know, behavior and mental process of humans. And when you're done with that, you need to do statistics. Now, uh, we do an in-class pretty neat demonstration of statistics where we make a human histogram and all that on height. I will try to film that and maybe get that to you online students. Um, it's a means to summarize data. And so descriptive statistics, it organizes, it summarizes it. The athletic, athletic arithmetic, heh, math is the devil to me. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, the arithmetic mean uh, is the average. That's just an old-fashioned average. The median is the middle set of the score. Uh, so the mean is the average. We add them all up. We divide by how many. The, the mean, median is we find the range, the, the lowest to the highest, and we find the exact middle. The mode is the one that we hit the most. Now, in a standardized normal curve, the mean, the mode, and the median should all be the same thing. Standard deviation measures how spread out scores are from the mean. So how far are they varied? Maybe you have them all lumped together. That's a low standard de deviation because averages are kind of unique like that. But maybe we have some really outlier, very low, very high, and so that you know that standard deviation pushes out and it becomes greater. Inferential statistics, basically you look at it and you try to make conclusions on evidence. Statistics don't lie, but liars make statistics. I said it in the last video, and I'm gonna say it again. Uh, significance test, when you get really into psychology and really into studying, you have to measure the statistical significance of uh, your experiment. And if it is more than 0.05, then yes, it worked. If it's less than 0.05, then that means it happened due to chance. So uh, it basically, chance can happen few times, five times or fewer out of 100. That's 0.05. And if you get 0.05 or less on your experiment, you're going to cry like Dawson here from Dawson's Creek because your experiment didn't work. It's just a quinky dink. Um, so some of the lab to the real world, choosing the best explanation. You have, I mean, there's so many things here. You can have a cross-sectional, uh, which is like CMAS social studies. They used to do that where they would test uh, your every junior year. Um, every three years, they would test juniors, which just didn't make sense. There were different samples. Longitudinal studies are where you take one group and you look at them every year, like the SAT, and you see if they grew. Uh, Judging the results, other statistical procedures to see how strong the independent variable was. There's meta-analysis where you take different, all these, you know, like 20, 30, 50, maybe 100 different experiments on the same thing and crunch the numbers and see if there's you know, a statistical trend when you look at multiple studies. That's called meta-analysis. Very difficult to do. Uh, they did 50 years of gender research, and they found out that men and women are virtually the same in terms of intelligence, but only a 1% to 5% difference between men were a little bit stronger in verbal and math ability, uh, excuse me, in spatial task. Uh, males were better in spatial task, but there's only a 1% to 5% difference between verbal, math, and aggressiveness and all that stuff, which is less than 0.05. So it, that means it's due to chance, but spatial visual task, that's the only thing that men and women are really different in terms of intelligence. Rarely does one study prove anything. A good study is replicated. If you do a study, someone else should be able to replicate it and prove or disprove your figures and your findings. And that's what science is all about. That's all I have. I hope you learned something. Uh, we'll see you in the next chapter.